All right, thanks everyone for coming back. I hope you're all feeling really refreshed. Uh, my name is Renny Edo Lodge. Uh, I'm a journalist and writer, and I'm chairing uh, the second um, part of today. Um, today, I'm joined with joined by uh, Stafford and Lee um, to speak a little bit more about. Um, sorry, I've written this down here. Some of the parallels between Tottenham and Brixton. Um, and what the current struggle is. And, and Lee, I'd really be keen to hear from you about um, some of the trials and tribulations that your family have been through over the past you know, 25, 30 years. And also, um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the Do The Right Thing campaign. Uh, so who wants to go first? Okay, so the, the video that we couldn't get working, we're going to quickly play that. So can we uh, have that light off, please? Um, it was the 28th of September. And I remember that the weather was still, was still quite good because in, in those days we had long summers. So the weather was still good. And um, it was about seven o'clock in the morning. And I was first alerted when I heard a noise. I just heard a, 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 a noise, which I now, I now know was the breaking in of the door. So I opened up my eyes at the time, and I saw my mum walking towards the door to go and see what the problem was. Now, as I said, at the time, my mum was everything to us. So I was rest assured that whatever the noise was, Mum's gone to see whatever that noise was, and I sort of dozed back off to sleep at the time. And um, and then I had another noise, and when I jumped up, I just saw my mum was on the floor. I, it looked like she'd been pushed f to me at the time, and I, I, I jumped up out of my sleep. And everything's like, am I, am I dreaming? Is this real? All I know, all I know is that my mum's on the floor. So I, I stood up on, on the bed and there was this policeman standing there with a gun in his hand, standing over my mum. So I'm confused. So in, in my mind, is she shot? Was she pushed? And I could see this gun. And then I just started shouting hysterically and, um, screaming, shouting, and swearing. I just remember, you know, being so angered that I felt that I wanted to attack this 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 man for 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 hurting my mum because I saw my mum on the floor and I saw her saw blood coming from the side of her, and I heard her say, "I can't breathe," and that she can't feel her legs. So at that point, I'm panicking because I'm, think, I'm not sure what's happened. So I just remember being in a state of confusion that there's people in our house. I didn't even realize at first that they were, they were police officers. And all, I am, all my attention is on is, is, is my mum laying on, on the ground and, and looking hurt like a, it's not, uh, it's not the right word to use, but the only thing I could describe is like a wounded dog that's been ran over, and you just you could just see the 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 the, the, the sort of you know that look in their face as that they've been hurt, and um, yeah, I just remember feeling you know angry and feeling like I wanted to do something about that. This is, this is my mum, this is my world. Um, this is the person that, that meant everything to me. And, um, and now I'm seeing her lying on the floor and um, helpless. So that was hard. And I remember the police officer, police officer at the time, he, then turned the gun and pointed it towards me and said, shut up, or someone better shut this kid up. And, um, and then at that point, 
I, I looked at my dad's face and he, I saw the fear in his face. And then he was then saying, Lee, calm down, calm down, and tried to usher me out of the room. So I wasn't necessarily in the moment straight away fearful of my own life because I was so concerned about what had just happened to my mum. But then after, you know, it started to kick in and it started to sink in that, um, you know, this, this, this officer was aggressive towards me and had the look in his face like he wanted to shoot me too. And I just remember thinking there was no, there was no compassion for, for, for the situation. It was, it was as if, I remember they still asking, where's Michael, where's Michael? And you know, when my mum was on the floor saying that she can't breathe, it, I heard someone saying, stop lying. So it was almost like they, they were, even in the moment, they still hadn't really considered what they'd just done. So that was quite hurtful and it confused me because they, here, here, here's these, the police were some previous to that was I looked up to, I was aspiring to be a police officer and then I see them do this. So it um, destroyed my, my view, my opinion of who I thought these people were. Um, so, yeah, I just, I just remember feeling very hurt, very angry, very confused, distressed, worried, and, um, and then the, the people, the only people who were there to console you were them. We're the same, the very same people. So that was even more confusing. You know, you've got police women trying to console you, trying to um, comfort you. And in your mind, you're thinking, but this is the enemy. You know, how can I trust these people? How can I, as much as I, I want that, um, that comfort and I needed that in that moment, um, I couldn't trust where it was coming from. And the one person that I could trust and who I really wanted to be consoled by was in, the, it was in that position. So I'm torn in a, in a position where you need your mum, but your mum looks like she needs you. So these were all the thoughts. Um, that was going through my mind at the time. So it was a lot, it was a lot to, 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 to take in and to be woken out of your sleep, to witness something like that. Um, How old were you at this time? Um, I was 11 at the time, 11. I just turned 11 in August and that happened in the September. So it happened at a very, um, sensitive time in my life in terms of my age, in terms of the fact that I just started secondary school and you're still, you're just starting to um, become aware of yourself. So it, le it left me in a very confused state of mind. Whoa, I, I, I welled up there just watching that. It brought me right back to that day. And, um, yeah, we thought it would be better for us to show the video because sometimes it's really difficult to bring yourself back there, and relive the moment and then come back out again to try and, you know, give a presentation on something. So we thought it would be better that we showed the video so that you can kind of connect with the emotion of what really happened and then, you know, I can actually speak about it after. So, that should have happened in the first half, and now we're going to just swiftly move on, right? And the, the whole point of that video, and there's, there's some more that we want to show, but the whole point of that video is that you can connect with what really happened and looking at it from our point of view as children, 
witnessing an incident like that. And there's a reason why we're talking about this. Because the Metropolitan Police, the commissioner, refuses to accept the damage that's been caused as a result of their actions. For you to refuse to acknowledge is saying that an 11-year-old, an 8-year-old, a 13-year-old, yeah, a 20-year-old, an 18-year-old would not have been affected. Again, we was quite... I by seeing their mother being shot, right? You don't have to be a psychologist, um, a therapist in any type of nature to be able to answer that question. Would those children in, those in that house at the time be affected by what they have just seen, right? This is the argument that we have today with the Metropolitan Police, right? So today is about reflecting on what happened, but also looking at where we are today in terms of the fight that the family's still going through to get that trauma acknowledged by the people who were responsible for causing that trauma, yeah? Um, who's up next? So what we're going to do, we're going to bring on Stafford now, who's going to talk about the parallels between what happens today. Because as a result of what happened to my mum, there was a there was an uprising. And if it wasn't for that uprising, it wouldn't be remembered in the same poignant way that it's remembered today. Right. So in that time, it was necessary and we are thankful to the community for coming together in that moment and rising up and making a stand for something which was wrong and should never have happened. And the inquest last year, it took 29 years for us to get those answers that we've been looking for all those years. But the inquest proved yeah, that what had happened was wrong because there was eight counts, accounts of failures by the Metropolitan Police um, where the planning and the implementation was concerned. And for those people who rose up at that time, that wasn't only a victory for us, it was a victory for them to know that what they stood up for was right. We, we knew instinctively it was right, but to have it proven in court actually confirms that whatever we was doing them times in terms of how we felt was truly right. Yeah? So... We're going to have Stafford come on now and he's just going to talk about some of the injustices that we face today and the parallel between 1985 and 1981 and even now in terms of what we're still going through. Yeah. Thank you. It's kind of a bit easy to um, consider parallels when you come from a place like Tottenham. But I spoke earlier on and spoke a bit about what happened on August the 6th, 1985. And I kind of said then that I was the person who called the meeting on the Baldwell Farm Estate in the Baldwell Farm Association that um, where we had the meeting and we left that meeting and everything kicked off. I was also the guy who um, led the demonstration to Tottenham Police Station on the 6th of August 2011, following the shooting, killing, murder of Mark Duggan, who was slain on the streets in Tottenham, who was left there to bleed out, whose notoriety was spread all over the media before anyone even had the decency to go and talk to his family and to talk to his parents. So much so that two days after the shooting, Two days after the shooting, we had to go to the police station because we needed to know whether or not in the police station they realised that someone had been shot and killed in Tottenham and that they had a moral duty and a legal duty to go and inform the family. But the behaviours that we faced on the 6th, 
the behaviours we face on the 4th, that the police could decide to go and shoot a man in broad daylight, a man that even today the jury said didn't have a gun in his hand at the point that they killed him. I mean, that's what we're talking about here with Cherry. The difference with Cherry was Cherry was a black mother and they went there looking for a black son. Mark Duggan, they went looking for him, but he wasn't in control of what they said he had. He wasn't who they told you he was. It was just a youth making his way, not always making good decisions, making some bad choices. But some of those young people are living the lives that they're living as a result of the stance that we took in the 80s. Because we took a stance that we wasn't going to give in to the system. We wasn't going to be just victims to the system either. So we took a stance to try and resist it. That resistance has, it has a cost to pay. Because it means when you resist the state, when you don't fully integrate, when you're not a part of the mainstream, those who come behind you are born isolated and marginalized. When we took the decisions we took back in the 80s, I don't want to say that we didn't think about the generations to come, but we were young people. We were suffering. Racism was overt and in your face and every single day reality. One of the worst things that people could say to me, because we was a mix back in those days, you, you heard what Devon said. Devon said when he came to this country, I was unfortunate enough to be born here. Vexed with my parents when I found out I was conceived in Jamaica, but they came here to make a better life for me. Because one of the worst things that a white person could say to me, and they said it every single time I did something that displeased them, was why don't you F off back to your own country? So we were born in a place that didn't want us. And we decided we were going to fight. Fight to make this our own. And we thought that that battle would last a generation. But it's lasted many generations. I did a speech once at Brixton Town Hall. On that platform was Tony Benn, Arthur Scargill, Red Ken, when he was red. He turned pink when he would become mere, but when he was red. And a big fat guy called Eric Heffer. They said that he was some militant, radical from the Labour Party. And I told them that the murder of PC Blakelock had been an unnecessary necessity. Never see a big fat man move so fast. He'd jump up and run off of the stage said I should never have said that. But what I was trying to say was this, we didn't want to kill anybody. We just want to live. We know exactly how it feels when people in our community are killed. And it was unnecessary necessity because they made what was unnecessary necessary. It's time that they felt our pain. We did it in the hope they would be the last. But since then, lots of black people have died all over this country. The statistics that you hear are just phenomenal. Sometimes when you look at them, you think, can this possibly be right? That so many people have died in police custody. And as Lee said, unless we stand up, England don't remember them. In 2011, we got, we got the media in the hall in Tottenham. I said to them, OK, welcome to my world. I'm going to tell you that four people that I personally know in my lifetime, and not my whole lifetime, I'm 55, since the age of 25, four people that I know personally have been killed at the hands of the police. And when I asked the media to tell me the four names, guess which names they could tell me? Cynthia Jarrett and Mark Duggan. And that's because Tottenham burned. So we lived in a society where we knew we couldn't get justice where we weren't going to get justice. So we had to go out there and do things for ourselves. We didn't expect that in the 21st century, we would still have to do these things. After those disturbances, riots, whatever they want to call them, happened in London in 2011 and spread across the country, what we saw the media and the Conservative Party do, actually all parties, they're all the same, 
what they did was dismiss the actions of young people as being feral youths. And the infants was they're just the children of the rioters before. That's all they know how to do. But actually, they didn't even give them that much credence. They said that they were just thieves and looters. They mixed everything up. They wanted to say that what happened in Tottenham was the same as what happened in Salford. Well, I'm sorry. What happened in Tottenham was about a community, first of all, losing one of its numbers. If Mark done something wrong, nick him. We're a community that's used to supporting our community. We'll support him in prison. We won't cut him off and just tie him just because he's in prison. We believe in redemption. We believe that people can and learn from their mistakes. So we'd have supported him. And guess what? He would have been out today. But they chose to take him out. And then not even give his parents respect because they believe that they're unaccountable. And the body that's supposed to, when we were doing all of these things, we had this thing called the Pol Police Complaints Authority. And we campaigned to get rid of them because they were crap. That literally was the police investigating the police. If something happened in London, Metropolitan Police, they're bringing the Essex Police. If something happened in Essex, they're bringing the Metropolitan Police. So we campaigned against that. We got this madness now called the IPCC. Them worse. They're worse. In Tottenham, they set us up that day. They were the ones who told the media that Mark Duggan had shot first, that Mark Duggan, the gunman, had opened fire and police officers had shot and killed him, when the truth was he didn't have a gun in his hand, he didn't shoot. None of those police officers who were at the scene believed that Duggan shot a gun. So how the IPCC was able to pull out that he did it, I don't know. But that's made, what made us go to the police station vex. And you know what? That was on the 4th of August. On the 5th of August, they knew that the bullet that lodged in the policeman's radio actually came from another police officer. And they chose not to tell the world, even though they told the world the lie. They told not to put it right, and they said why. And when we asked them why, they said, because we didn't want to raise anti-police feelings. But their job is not to care about anti-police feelings, their job is to hold police officers to account. The IPCC are the very reason why, in that inquest, we ended up with this perverse verdict that said an unarmed man can be shot and killed in this country, and that is somehow lawful and justifiable. And the reason why it's so is because when they did eventually come to the family's house, after Tottenham burned, they said, what do you want us to do? What shall we investigate? And the mum said, the gun was planted. And they said, we'd investigate that. And then they took taxpayers' money. And it's important to understand this, because the myth about the IPCC is the problem with them is they're all ex-police detectives. No, they're ex-police. Even their head of policy is ex-police. Their head of finance, their head of legal services is ex-police. And what they did was every... Um, professional that they hired to come into the inquest, they told them to carry out their investigation, their analysis from the perspective that Duggan had the gun in his hand, which meant at no time did they investigate the gun being planted, which meant the professionals came into court and this is when we asked them questions, could, could he have had the gun in his hand and thrown it after he was shot through the arm by a, a, a bullet this big? Probable, but not possible. Isn't it more probable that the gun was put over there, 20 feet away from where it was found? I don't know, because nobody asked me to look at it. So a jury that didn't believe the police officers, and that's what everyone needs to know in here today, the jury did not believe the police. But having been given no other information, came up with a ludicrous verdict, a perverse verdict, that defied all common sense and all logic. 2011. But that happened to us in 2001. It happened to us in the 80s. We had cases like Roger Sylvester where police squeezed him to death. Eight police officers from Broadwell Farm squeezed the living daylights out of him for over 45 minutes until he died. And they told us, and there, we had to wait five years for an inquest. Inquest took about three months to hear, the, or two months to hear all of the the evidence, and within two hours came back with a verdict of unlawful killing. The police said 
Where's Raju? Because I always get this terminology wrong. We learn some new terminology when we go to inquest. But the police basically said that Roger Sylvester worked de delirium, excited delirium. Right? Have you ever heard of this before? It's something that only happens to black people when they're in contact with the police. Excited delirium. They worked himself up so much that he combusted from inside. He just blew up and just combusted. Yet we saw a battered, battered body that they put on a ventilator, a life support machine for days before they gave him his dignity and turned it off. When they did it to Joy Gardner, they said she was the strongest woman that they'd ever come across in their life. What Joy Gardner done? She had the indignity and the temerity to overstay in this beautiful country. She hadn't committed no crime, no criminal offence. She just stayed. And when they went to take her out of this country, they wrapped 14 feet of masking tape around her face, her nose and mouth. Killed her and said that she was the most strongest woman they'd ever come across. And when they killed Mark Duggan, they said he was one of the top 43 gangsters in Europe. No disrespect to Mark. I can find 43 badder boys in Tottenham in a blink. So they kill us. And then they use their friends in the media to demonize us, to make us out as if somehow we're lesser than human beings. Most recently, we saw that television documentary, Britain's Hidden Slave Owners. Do you see it? Who didn't see it? Go and watch that, because it tells the story that we've always known. Everything that they have here is on our backs that came from. It's on our backs they came from, and that's where this started where they demonized and they made out that we're less than human beings so that would enable and allow them to keep us as slaves, to treat us as slaves, to breed us as slaves. When you saw when Cameron went to Jamaica the other day, the stats that come out is what you need to watch. They said that when they took over the island, there was a couple of, there was a hundred or so slaves that they took from the Spanish. They took one million, three million slaves in total. They accept that they took to the Americas, including one million to Jamaica. In Jamaica, they had a prolific breeding program. So that they built it up to three million. But on the day of independence, on the day of freedom, on the day of the end of slavery, there was 30,000 there. That is genocide. That is a hatred of us. And now that we're here in their midst, they hate our sights because we remind them, you're not pure. You're not great. You know, they don't even talk about Great Britain no more because we're here. And they can't fool us with that crap no more. That's why many people come here because they told the colonies how great they were. It happened in the 80s. It's happening now. They're a lot more subtle. We won. We moved. We had the Lawrence inquiry. We had the McPherson investigation. We had the, the acknowledgement of institutional racism. And now they've learned the language. More black people have been arrested and charged with racially aggravated offences, normally against police officers, than white people have been arrested and charged for aggravated offences. Their denial, their denial is our deaths. It's great that you're all here today. It's beautiful you're all here today. It's great to share some history with some of those who may not the his know the history. Don't let this be a one-off. Let's stand by this family. Let's stand by them. Let's demand that they get justice. Let's demand that they see us differently. And let's demand that they treat us differently. And let's remember, we have no choice. Because if we don't do it, we're leaving it to the little next generation to do it. We've done that too far. We've got to come together, stay together, and fight for justice. Enough respect, Brixton. <laughs> Thank you both. That was really incredibly powerful. So um, the final person we've got to speak is um, Raju from Bat Murphy. Um, are you in the room? All right, find your way to the front. Um, Raju is um, the solicitor for Lee's family, and he's going to tell us a little bit about um, the fight that the family's been enduring for the past 30 years.
less than 15 minutes. It's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to be part of the journey on which this family, Juliet, Rosemary, Sharon, Lisa, and Lee, The events in 1985, um, for me, like many other people here today, was a milestone in my own life, a milestone in our histories, and a milestone in the history of this country. What happened here rang out across the country. We've heard about the echoes in Tottenham, but I can tell you the was also rang out in Southall, in Bradford, and many other parts of the country. But you haven't asked me to come to and talk about that. I want to talk about Cherry Gross and the Metropolitan Police. 26 years after the shooting, Cherry died a death, which was the result of the injuries she sustained after having been shot. 26 years while the Metropolitan Police sat on a report of an investigation which had demonstrated without any, any doubt whatsoever where the faults lay. 26 years during which the Metropolitan Police had not shared the findings of that investigation with Cherry while she was alive. And it was only after her death, in the course of the inquest that Lee talk about, talked about, the lead up to that inquest, forced the Metropolitan Police to share that report, to disclose it to the family, so that they could see for themselves for the first time the multiple serious and catastrophic failings in the planning and the implementation of that armed raid on that tragic day. After the inquest into Cherry's death, when a jury having heard evidence over several weeks, when that jury in effect confirmed the findings of that investigation from 26 years before, Sir Bernard Hogan Howe, the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, had this to say, and please allow me to just say these words, which are the words of the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, because they say a lot. He says, on Sunday 28th September 1985, an officer from the Metropolitan Police shot Cherry Gross. It was preventable, and her injuries left her paralyzed until her death 25 years later. Today, he says, Today, I apologize unreservedly for our failings. I also apologize for the inexcusable fact that it has taken until now for the Met to make this public apology. Sadly, he said, sadly, this means that the person who most deserved to hear the apology, those words, we are sorry, is no longer here. However, and this is what I want to emphasize. However, he says, Cherry's children, her friends and others are here, and they too deserve an apology. I am sorry for the years of suffering which our actions and omissions caused to your family. So there is a man there who is publicly acknowledging the harm that his officers had caused to this family, to the survivors of that tragic day. In the days and weeks that followed, he took the remarkably, remarkable and rare step of meeting this family in person. In all my 30 years of practice, it's the first time I've seen a commissioner do that. He took the step of meeting this family in person to apologize to them, and he led them to believe that he wanted to do whatever he could so to resolve the trauma that they had suffered. He acknowledged that trauma and he assured them that he would do whatever he could to make amends. 
that assurance was repeated subsequently, both by him in personal correspondence with Lee and by his solicitors to the family solicitors. And then after six months of that dancing the dance, suddenly his solicitors turn around and say, actually, we're not going to do anything here. We're not going to sit down with you. So you, the family, can do what you like. No explanation, no meaningful explanation. What do, we, what do we make of this? A man who we have to acknowledge had the courage to apologize to this family in person suddenly loses his courage, suddenly finds that the ground has fallen away from him. Well, if he has lost the, that strength, then this family will give him the strength to do what it takes. This family, and I'll take their names again, Juliet, Rosemary, Sharon, Lisa, Lee, you are remarkable individuals. You're not just survivors, but your strength gives us strength. You will show the Metropolitan Police, you will show the Commissioner that they have to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you to Bat Murphy, Raju once again. A thank you to Claire, who's here as well, right? And um, I'll never forget, right, after that inquest, I was speaking to Raju in, in, the, um, in the office, and I said to him, I feel like there's more work to do, right? I feel like we won the victory in the inquest, you know, but what? What can I do for the community that stood up for us, who rose up for us? You know, I feel like I still, there's still work to do. And he looked at me and he said, Lee, the work that you've done so far and you're continuing to do, you may never ever see the fruits of your labor, but trust me, other people will benefit from it. And I could live with that. So as much as we're talking about the injustices, what have happened and the wrongdoings, and, and they are terrible stories that we're telling you today, and they're the truth, I still want us as a community to take strength from the fact that we are resilient. We are not prepared to, to accept the injustices that are happening. And they may be small victories, but we still must celebrate those small victories because they will have an impact on the future, yeah? We're gonna show um, another video, right? And the picture that was just up a little while ago was um, us at the time when my mum was shot, right? Could you believe they let the reporters in the house to take pictures of us, lined us up on the sofa just after my mum had just been shot and took that picture. And um, the next video that we're gonna show talks a little bit more about the impact um, that, that of, of the shooting that took place and some of the things that we had to go through um, in the years after my mum's shooting. Yeah, are we ready? Again, we was quite isolated in, in the house, so we didn't really know exactly what was going on until we saw on the news that there had there'd been, been a riot, an outbreak and um you know people are taken to the streets and um and that added to the chaos for us that added to the confusion that added to everything that was, was already happening so um again we, we 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 just didn't we couldn't comprehend it in terms of the magnitude of what was really going on and um 
it just felt like, I, I remember driving through Brixton when we had to go to our grand and it just looked like a war zone. Um, cars were turned over and there was just a lot of stuff happening. So it just heightened, um, as I said, how we felt in terms of the confusion. It just felt like the world was going mad in our eyes. Um, so I call it an uprising, but it's classified as a riot. And I saw that as the community coming together, where they see it as the community being destructive. And at the end of the day, there was elements about the riot which are not so nice. And um, we wouldn't have condoned that, my mum wouldn't have condoned that, but at the same time, um, we understand that the community were responding to something which had happened and they were asking questions and was getting no answers and as a child I can say to you how I felt and I just think that that, whole, that feeling just had a ripple effect in the community in terms of how we really felt about the injustice which had happened to us.